All right, guys, welcome to 6-2. We will follow this by 6-3, our very last day of instruction for this first semester of calculus. We're going to piggyback off of what we went over last time and introduced in chapter six, which was the area under the curve. That's what our integral integration or antiderivative finds for us. We then talked about what it would look like if we found the area between, not just under two curves. And now we're going to put a little spin on integration by literally taking a line, usually an axis, whether it be the X or the Y, and spinning these things around. So just like before, we'll start with just the area under a curve, and then we'll look at multiple curves. And if you've read through some of this stuff, you'll see what these last two sections, which is actually doing the exact same thing, will entail. Because when we take the area, which is a two-dimensional shape, and we spin it and rotate it around, it now comes at you and goes away and becomes 3D. All right? So that's what we're going to be doing in these last two sections. We're just going to see a bunch of different scenarios that is going to hopefully allow us to find a bunch of different techniques to for lack of a better term, solidify what we are finding in a much simpler way. All right. So just like we talked about finding the area under the curve, we talked about Riemann sum. Remember that? All those little cuts, those rectangles. And then we found the sum of them all. And we said this was the big capital letter S we call sigma in Greek letters. And if we could, we didn't want to just make four cuts. We didn't want to just make 8, 16, 32, 64. We wanted an infinite number of cuts, and therefore we had to introduce or reintroduce all the way back from chapter 2, the limit. Because we can't physically make an infinite number of cuts. And so we're going to be doing something similar to that, but with three-dimensional solids. So we're still going to need boundaries, and we're going to need a what they call cross-sectional area that is typically going to be perpendicular to the x-axis, and of course we like it to be continuous on a closed interval. So that there's no issues that we have to worry about, and we can think of it as that full solid shape. And you all know that we were able to replace this to find the area under a curve with that beautiful elongated English letter S instead of this Greek capital S we call sigma. But now notice instead of F of X DX, which represented the length and the width for the area under these curves, we are now going to be talking about a thing called volume for that third dimension, which, if you recall from geometry, there were a bunch of different shapes that we went over and tried to find the volume, the space inside. And by doing that, the good news is, my friends, we still get to replace all of this with that, which we still know that means to find the antiderivative. But now we're going to have an area and we're still going to have a width. But by multiplying an area, now when we multiply an area times a width, we are going to have our volume in that third unit measurement or dimension. Okay, so we can do this both with respect to the X axis. So all of our things are in terms of X, or instead we can make it with our Y axis. So again, instead of A and B, we could call it C and D, whatever, all right? We still need our parameters to find that definite integral or antiderivative, but now we need to figure out what's going to be best. To look at this 
along the x-axis with respect to that from some a to b? Or would it be best to look at it if it's a curve like this? Maybe we want to go from c to d. So either way, if you remember those Riemann sums, dealt with those little rectangles that we cut and sliced up. We're going to be doing the same thing. Always what we call perpendicular to the axis of rotation. And by rotation, I mean we are going to literally take this thing and we are going to spin it around. And when we do, that's going to create this. And every other one to become some solid. Now, of course, I can't do it justice with my fancy Apple pencil. So I wanted to give you a visual. Now, this is a pretty simplistic one. But the good news is we are still doing what we've been working on for the last two chapters. Antiderivative. The only difference is instead of f of x dx, we are now going to have the area function dx. And the problem with that is you notice that if it's something like this that we're looking at, whether it be a line, a downwards facing parabola, a logarithmic function, all these different things that we've talked about, not just in this semester, but all prior courses. We're going to have to take and make them solids. And sometimes to make them solids, we're going to have to rotate them around a line, an axis. Right? So what's going to be better than just three cuts to this? Cut it more, cut it more, cut it more. What's cool about this is we get to decide what the width of all of these are these little rectangles that are now becoming three-dimensional shapes. But those widths are going to be the same in every single one, which is why we can just classify them as that. What is going to change, if you notice, is that quote-unquote height that we found, that f of x that we used to do for our length times our width. Those always changed and you guys know when things vary, we have to use variables. So notice, not only are our heights still changing, in this one it looks like they're getting smaller, then that also now means that our area is changing. Okay, so very similar to what we did before, but now our area is changing. And that's where it gets a little weird. Okay, if I was to take any one of these slices, let's just say this one here. Would you guys know what shape that is? Can you see it if I pulled it out? Extracted it? Can you guys see that? But it would have some thickness, wouldn't it? That's why it's 3D. And that thickness, my friends, is that. So all we really need to be able to do is find that length and that width of that shape, whatever it is. And again, this is where a lot of students start struggling. This is where Math 5B or Calc 2, wherever you're taking it, this is where students struggle. because. You can't draw these very well, and you have to visualize. You have to use your imagination a little bit to see these things. So I'm trying to give you guys some examples, explanations verbally and visually with a graph. And of course, this one, like I said, is pretty standard looking. Lots of straight lines. We've been talking about areas under curves. So what's going to happen when these things aren't straight lines and so easy to find? 
we still want to streamline this process. So we're going to take these flat two-dimensional figures that we've been dealing with from 6, 1 and before with those antiderivatives, length times widths that were changing. And instead of just finding the area under the curve, we're now going to take the area and spin it around to find the volume and create that three-dimensional figure. So here's what this process looks like. What if I had a curve like this? Kind of looks like an inverse trig function. Okay. Regardless, if this is my function, okay, we know from here, call it A and here, call it B, we can find the area under this curve. And we don't need the approximation with the Riemann sum. We can actually integrate and find that area under the curve. But if we wanted to make it volumized, we need to take either the y-axis or the x-axis or any other line. We'll just start with these. And we are going to rotate it, spin it around. And so you can see when I start that, it starts to do this. And this is the way that we will usually denote that we've done a rotation. And when we start doing that, you see it starts forming a three-dimensional shape rather than this flat one here. And when we spin it all the way around, you can see we get some weird looking shape like this. We then want to find not just about what the volume of that thing is, we want to find exactly what that is. Do any of you guys have a 3D printer? Have you ever seen one? Do you think it needs to know a little bit of math, maybe even some calculus, in order to know what to start with and what to actually end up creating? Pretty extraordinary that they're actually able to take what we know how to print, which is two-dimensional, flat, words, shapes, but now to give it some volume, not just tilt our axes, Notice that's what they did. They tilted our X and our Y instead of having them flat. They just kind of like brought it out a little bit. So now there's that third dimension. Whoa. And with that, now we can have volume instead of just area. Okay, so I'm just going to fill in a few blanks here. And if you guys can see what I would actually end up doing with this is drawing that representative rectangle, we call it. We're going to call it a slice of this thing. And if I took that and rotated it around this, that slice would still look like this here. And if I kept rotating that round, now what it would it end up looking like? Because it's curved on the ends, now it's going to look like a what? Can you guys see that? What would you call that? If I could just take that and extract it out. Okay, um, I do have a question here. Is that a circle or an oval? Great question. What's the difference? Uh, the oval will have a greater length than Y and shorter length in x, and the circle will have the same length in x and y in the end. Okay. Now, you said it. What, what is it? What are you talking about? Um, the chunk. Um, this here? You? Yeah. Great question. Soraya, what did we end up doing? We took this curve, this function, right? And mm -hmm. all we did was rotate it about that. So what's going to be true about this little chunk? It will be the same on both sides, wouldn't it? Yeah. What about this little chunk? Be the same. How about yeah. this? And do you see what I'm forming? 
seem yeah right if i just took it and i mirrored it on the other side it would look like this do you see that yeah now why does this one look ovalish elongated well remember that's because they took and they shifted to give you that third dimension they tilted our x and y axis so it's not flat because you couldn't really see it here oh oh so when i'm actually looking at the end of it i'm just looking at the y which is also the radius of the circle ah very good excellent but yeah i was just getting it confused with the x i thought the x and the y will have the same length in the end so it, i was kind of confused. yeah it totally depends on your function yeah. right yeah but what are we doing? We're just rotating it about this. So when you rotate any of this about it, it's going to be the same on both sides. And like you said, that means it's circular. Now, why does it end up looking ovalish in shape? Because we've got it tilted. See, it's not X and Y flat anymore. It's tilted a little bit so that we can see that third dimension. Okay, great question. Great question. So what we're going to call this little piece that we are going to focus in on, this solid piece that we could take out, we're actually going to call it exactly what it looks like, a disc. Does that make sense? Why they call it a disc? I used to play ultimate Frisbee with the club team over at Fresno State all the time. And that's exactly what they call a Frisbee is a disc. Right? Because it's solid. Now, if you have an aerobie, if you guys know what I'm talking about, that one has the center cut out. We'll talk about those a little bit later. And what we're going to name those as well. Okay, so what we are trying to do is generalize how to find the volume of this solid by using what we already know. Soraya helped us out. When we rotate something around, what do we end up forming when it goes around something? What kind of shape? That would be a circle. And don't we already know how to find the flat two-dimensional area of that circle? Then to make it volumized, we will take that flat piece here, whether it's in the middle there or way out here or here. Notice it's different everywhere. Do you guys see that? To make it volume, we need a thickness to each and every one of those flat circles. We need it to have that thickness around. In order to see that thickness, what we're going to do is tilt it a little bit so that you can see the thickness of it, right? Because otherwise, it just looks flat like a circle. And what did we say that we could do with each and every one of those cuts? Multiply it with the difference of x. That's right. We called it the width, or in this case, now it's the thickness of it. That's right. So with each one of those slices, we're going to take that common width. And just like we did with area, where that was our dx, it's still going to be our dx. But now we're going to have this thing called the area that we're looking at in here times that thickness to give it the volume. All right, and that's the main difference from what we've been doing for about a chapter into now this last chapter in few sections of volume. All right, so we're going to still take that 2D that we've been working with, which used to be just the height of it, the f of x, 
and we're going to turn it into three dimensional. And in order to find that height now, instead of it just being f of x, which was our height, now when we spin and rotate it around, what did we say forms when we spin something around? Now we form a circle, a circular shape. It's hard to draw a three-dimensional figure with those dashes and everything else. We will have that thickness still of dx. But instead of our height, what we used to find for area, now what is it going to be? That is now going to be the radius of our circle. Okay, so that's the main difference in what we are talking about with these slices we're going to call solid disks. All right, and because every single one of these, as we rotate them around, are going to have that round shape. Do you guys remember how to find the area of a circle? Pi r squared. That's right. It is pi r squared. And if we now have how to find that height, that radius, we're now calling it you know that this is going to be the thing that's changing now. Do you guys see that? Just like it was before it varied, our height did. Now that's going to be our radius for each one of these rotations around with some thickness. Some thickness we will have. Um. I have another question. I know you answered this already, but I just want to be really sure. So in the second diagram, like see how the x-axis is tilted. It's just a projection of it. Like it's not really tilted. Um, I don't know what you mean by not like, really. Like, um, let's say like my dx, right? The length should be perpendicular to x-axis, right? Like, yeah, that's what I was just trying to figure out. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, it's just like moving your head and going around this way a little bit to look at your thing rather than straight on. Got it. And that's just so that you can see the volume of this thing rather than if it was flat, you're looking at the side, you'd only be able to see the flat side. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, good. Gladly clarify any questions because this is tricky. I'm trying to go slow. So here's the good news, my friends. Because we know that when we rotate around, we're always going to get a circle, then we therefore know the area formula that we said could change. The width of these things will not. So now we get to take this, whether it's with respect to y or x, and we get to replace this with the pi r squared. The problem is, what do we say our radius is going to do as we rotate it around? It's going to change. It's going to differ. And therefore, we got to make sure that we know how to find those different heights or radii. And that's still going to vary and therefore be what our function looks like, but as a circle. So that takes us to our next definition or theorem. And before I give it to you, I wanted to make sure that you got one more visual here. What if we had a parabola shifted right one and up one? And I mean, it's vertex from zero, zero. 
and I wanted to find the area under the curve. You guys know how to do that. That's easy. Integrate from whatever, say negative one to three. And what's changing for the length and the width of each of these? Well, that we can define to be the same, but the height is changing for each and every one of these by this. So that's where we said it was f of x dx. Everybody with me there? But when I take that thing and I rotate it around now the x-axis, it produces that thing we called a disk. Right? Again, just giving you one. Look at it. Here's my representative rectangle that we started with Riemann sums. When I took that and rotated it around, it now became a solid three-dimensional figure instead of this flat length times width area. Now it has volume. And we will still take that length and that width, but we know to find the area, it would just be the area of that flat circle and then multiplied by the width of it. And so that's where we get the pi r squared times the width, which we're just going to call delta or dx. And because our radius depends on the height of this thing, is everybody with me on the radius part and the height being the same? Here it was just the height, which we got by this, my y value. The radius now of this circle is still dependent on the height, the y value. And if we looked at it from negative one to three, then it would create this cool looking shape, three dimensions. And now we can find the whole volume of this thing rather than just the boom, flat, two dimensional area to our x axis. We're just rotating it about. Okay, so again, generalizing it instead of negative one and three, we could say that this is A and this is B. And now to find the volume, we need that third dimension. So we are going to have the area of it times the thickness of it. But because we know that we're rotating it around, what do we say the area would always be? Pi r squared. And what do we say we would do to find our r? Our radius, because it varies, what did we say we had to have in here? The y value. Which we're going to call in general f of x, our function. You guys, you just came up with the way to find the volume of a disk scenario. Now, don't forget, volume should be in cubic units, right? Does everybody see that when I square this, I will have square units? But when we multiply by the dx, that is going to give me my cubic units. And of course, we can do it with respect to x or with respect to y. So again, I would like you guys all to know two things that you can do to make this a little bit simpler. One, because that this is just a limit. Remember, with limits, we can pull out any constant. So I'm going to rewrite this as pi times from A to B, my f of x squared dx. And again, you can do that with the y value as well. Might as well pull it out so I don't have to deal with it twice. I'll just throw it in at the end. Okay. Hopefully you got that down. Again, using the circle area formula because what we are actually finding is, as mentioned, the area of this circle that's going around all this part and then multiplying by its thickness. 
we're calling DX. <laughs> I hear you, Heath. I know you're a visual person. Hopefully this is helping. Okay, and again, why is our radius? I'm gonna put and highlight this in quotes. Why is it written as f of x? Because it varies from point to point. You can see the radius is real small here, bigger out here. Whether you went downwards or upwards, you can see the radius from our center, which is our axis of rotation, our radius length, is going to vary at any point. Okay. Um, oh, go ahead, Sarai. Yeah. Um, so in this course, are we always going to rotate or are there going to be times we have like a block or like or a different shape to work on? Like um, like how the ends are always a circle because we are rotating it, the y, the fx, we are rotating it. Are we always doing that or are we like getting like, like a square, maybe like a block by the end and then we have to get like, yeah, something like, like that. I like that one. Yeah. Yeah, so there are definitely different techniques to doing that. If you can find the area of one, which you can see these are all trapezoidal, right? But they get bigger in size, or you can think of them as getting smaller in size as our X's get larger. Well, if you can find the area of that, now all we wanna do is take any one of these and give it some thickness. But it's a trapezoid. Like how am I getting the base of it? Like the bottom side, bottom length of the shape. Yeah, so it again, it's a great question. It's going to really depend on what you are given on how you're going to attack these. So if you're given a solid figure like this and it's not been rotated to already come up with this, then no, you're not going to be using the, since it's not rotating around, you're not going to use the round circle approach. But to answer your question in this class, yeah, we're just scratching the surface, okay? We're going to pretty much talk about these rotations where we end up with what is called a disc. Okay. And then if you remember when we talked about at the beginning, the area between curves, last okay. section, what's that going to look like? If I had this one and then say another one, like a parabola, and we wanted to find the area between them. Well, now when I rotate that around, now we're gonna have just this part, and therefore we're gonna have a void in here. Got it. So you're a little bit ahead, but that's exactly where we are going. Make sure that you guys definitely have these two written down. Again, they are the same, other than if you're with respect to Y and you're going around the Y axis compared to the X axis. There will be times when we will need this scenario because it's much easier to do than this one. So in this section, there is one more scenario that we're gonna get to. And as you can see, Soraya gave me the nice little segue there. What are we gonna call these? Well, look at the graph here and then tell me what you think this may resemble in the real world. A cylinder? Close. A cylinder is solid. That's when we take, for example, a circle, and then we raise it up, that same circle, and now we have that solid. A CD? This one actually has a what in it? A hole. A hole. And can you guys see what this kind of resembles? 
for anybody that has tinkered with putting things together or worked on vehicles. I just put running boards along my truck because my wife is short and so are my kids because they're young and they're having trouble jumping up into my truck right now. So I was like, all right, I'm going to buy some running boards and I put them on this weekend and I needed to use these things, both a lock nut and a regular. Maria, you nailed it. Washer. Very good, Stephen. It's called a washer. Doesn't that look like one? If you guys have ever seen those flat washers, which are just buffers in between so that you don't hurt the piece that you're actually screwing into or bolting down. So for lack of a better term, that's exactly what we're going to call it is what we see. We're going to call it a washer. And like I said, because now we can see a disc is a solid. A washer has some circular hole in the middle. And again, why circular? Because we're still going to take, this time, the area between two curves. And we're still going to be rotating it about. And when we take that area or that representative rectangle, perpendicular to the thing that we're rotating it about, it will then become that three-dimensional because it has thickness, that dx, it will become that three-dimensional solid. And because we have that, if we were to do it everywhere, notice, again, the radius is going to change. And not just by this. If it was just by that square root function from one to four, then we would have this to the x-axis that we're rotating it about. And therefore, we would have had this on this side, wouldn't we? See that solid? But we also have this void in the middle. That if we were looking at y equals 1 everywhere, then it would go down to negative 1, wouldn't it? And everything into here is what we actually want to what? Subtract. Good. We want to remove it. And the way that we do that in math, removing things is by subtraction. Very good. So guess what we're going to do? We're going to do the same thing we did above. But now because we have two functions and one of them we want to subtract off or remove that area under the curve. And as we rotate it about, it's also going to be this. We want to remove that piece. And because it is circular, we are going to go around and we're going to have to take the upper minus the lower. But this is where a lot of people get confused. They're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Why is it pi something squared? Well, remember, guys, we're still rotating it around. And when we do that around, that's going to yield a circle, a circular shape. And because it has some thickness to it, then so does this, which means now it's volume instead of just area. And so we can still pull that pi outside and not worry about it but now we're going to have what i like to call our big r squared minus our little r squared and what do i mean by big r and little r from the center that we are rotating about notice this would be my big r and this would be my little r that i want to subtract off so when we look at it, we're looking, and I'll try to use the same colors here. From our center here, we're looking at our big R being that upper function. And our little r would be our lower function. And just like we did in 6.1, where we were only looking at area, we weren't rotating it about some line, some axis, to find that area between the curves. 
We took the upper and found all the area under it. But then we removed this piece to be left with what we wanted. We're still doing the same thing with the exception of because we are rotating it around, what do we have to do? We have to use our area of a circle, pi r squared. The problem is we still have an outer radius and an inner radius that we're going to have to subtract and remove. And the number one problem that students make, everybody watch, pay attention, they will do this. And they're like, I did my pi r squared where I subtracted them. No, 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 no. Please don't do that. You have to do the pi r squared for the outer, bigger r, and then subtract the little r. And you have to square each of them in order for this to work. Why can we just pull the pi out? Because both of these would have it. So again, if you think of it as separate versions, get rid of this. You'd be finding just this one, all of that from one to four. Then we'd be looking at just this one. And in order to find each individually, we would have to do the pi capital R squared minus pi little r squared. And that would only be area. To get the thickness, we need the dx or dy, depending on whether you're doing it to the x-axis as your rotation or your y-axis. I have okay. a question. Yep, go ahead, Sarah. Um, so like my fx, I know it's a curve, and my gx is a straight line. Will it always be that? OK, but why am I integrating my gx then? Because if it's a straight line, it will always be a straight circle. Like, it's not changing its shape. So will it always be that? Huh? Will it always be a straight line? No, but I mean the formula, if I put my G I understand. In you're, you're looking at one example, Sarai. You're looking yeah. at just this easy example that I gave you and saying, well, why do I need this? I don't need it. It's always going to be the same. It's not always going to be the same. That's what I'm trying to prove to you. Okay, but I mean, if it's like this, do I have to integrate my GX or do I just subtract it? I would recommend you always doing this so that you don't have to worry about when it's this, can I just do that? And when it's that, can I just do this? I like to generalize things so that you can do it one way and it always works. Okay. Because, yeah, what if I change this to ln of x? Or let's say g of x was one third to the x. Now it's going to look like this. And you're not going to just have that line. And you're still going to want to find all that in between. So again, this is just a way to do it generically. Okay. Good question and good observation. Yes, it will always be the same for this because the Y, the height, the radius does not change. But you're not always going to just have a constant. Most of the time you'll have something that varies and it will have a variable, even if it's a line. Okay, this is the last question I'll ask. Um, I doubt it, but go ahead. I'm sorry. Good, um, so for GX, right? Um, and if I'm using this formula, why, like, what, like, why am I exactly integrating it, the GX square? So let me get rid of this one for you. Yeah. And let's find the volume of revolution. Now, you're always going to be integrating whenever you're trying to find the area under the curve or now volume. The only difference is we will have three units or dimensions rather than just two. When it was area, all we had was the length times the width or the height times the width, dx, right? Yeah. 
but now we're trying to find the volume. And if I got rid of this function, and I asked you to just find it of this from, again, let's say one to four, could you just use your fact that you know it's a rectangle and then it would be this? Yeah. And find the volume? Yeah. You know the volume of that shape? Yeah. Like times width times height? It's kind yeah. of hard to see, right? Because you have two dimensions. But by us rotating this around, we can see it's got some thickness to it, which is still going to be our width dx that we had over here. But again, you would only be looking at this part of it, not that one, right? We got rid of that. And if we rotated that around, you would still have, but it would all be the same. And by the way, there's your cylinder. So can I not just use the volume formula for a cylinder and get that area? So right, you can do whatever you want. Got it. If you know for that scenario, you have to use this. For this yeah. scenario, you have to use that. I am trying to give you the generalization for any time you have something like this. Got it. So if you know that this is a solid and you know how to find the volume of that solid, sure, you can get around doing calculus, no pun intended. But when we rotate this around, we want to be able to do it using our calculus that we've learned in this last about chapter and a half now. Okay, got it. Okay. So let me try to generalize this even more. I don't know if Sarai is going to like this, but I'm going to say we are going to do that outer radius, the bigger radius, minus the smaller. And I like bigger and smaller better than outer and inner, but either way. Because that works for both respect to X and with respect to Y. The only difference with the Y is now if we're rotating about the Y axis, our outer would be out here and our inner would be here. Okay, still the bigger R minus the smaller R. All multiplied by the pi. We're just factoring it out and our width. Whether that is a representative rectangle with width of y, or usually a width of x. Okay, so that representative rectangle, starting with our 2D graph, like we've been working on for the past week or so, that is going to really help you to understand, okay, I can see that there, they want that, and I need to get this. And if I know that, when I rotate it around this, then I know that I'm going to end up writing it like this with respect to X. Where obviously if it's the other way around, then we're going to have everything with respect to Y, which means now we want to know what X equals with our Y's within our equations. So sometimes they'll give it to you like that. Sometimes you're going to have to solve for the X and then plug it in. Just don't forget that you're going to have to have, and I'm going to highlight this for you, each of these things squared when you subtract. Do not just square the whole thing and subtract them like when you just did it here in the area between the curves. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. All right. So that's just about it. Last few things I wanted you to fill in is to make sure that what is going to help you to see these things, obviously, to what? Graph them and then draw a representative rectangle, we call it. And how do you want that representative rectangle to be? Perpendicular 
to your axis of rotation. We'll talk about in the next section here, what happens when you don't. Okay. That's it. I would really like to do one example with you all. That's pretty extreme. I know it's going to be a little weird. Some of you are going to get it. Some of you aren't. But at the end, the result is really cool. So your problems won't always look like this. They'll look more like that. Okay, they'll look sometimes with a graph, sometimes without. Okay, you guys need to know what to do. And when you're going to have a disk and when you're going to have, and that's all I got for you there is just six problems. Okay, I'm going to do one of them. But when to have a disk situation and when to remove that hole in the middle we call a washer. All right, so let's do this one real quick together and then we'll move on to the very last section of not only this chapter, this unit, but the class. All right, try to hold your excitement, Zenon. So what is this saying in this particular problem? I want to find the volume of a sphere with radius r. So I'm not even going to tell you what it is. I'm just going to have you find it. And does everybody know what we would have to start with in order to find the volume of a sphere? What's that visual going to be? Everybody good with my circle? Why am I going to start with a circle? What am I going to do to make it have volume? You're going to rotate it. About what, Austin? The x-axis, preferably. Yeah, good. And I agree. It doesn't technically matter, right? If you have a ball, if I took it and I spun it on my finger, that would be around the y-axis, right? It's hard to do on the x-axis because <laughs> gravity, okay? But for us, it doesn't matter if it spins this way, like a globe, or this way, or even on the tilt, like Earth. Either way, it's still going to have that volume and does anybody know the equation? Does anybody know how? Four by three pi r cube. That's right. We already know this, don't we? At least we should. Something we went over a long, long time ago, probably high school, maybe even junior high. Some of you were introduced to it. I'm going to prove to you that it is that using calculus. I'm going to show you why it's that. And what you all just told me, well, by you all, I mean Austin, is that we're going to start with this circle. We're going to rotate it about the x-axis. And I know that from this center, if I went out anywhere on this thing, it would have a radius. Correct? That is my R. And in order to find volume, we know that we are going to take that representative rectangle anywhere on here. And we're going to find that height. Call it Y, call it F of X, whatever you want. And I know I'm going to end up doing pi from something to something. This is going to be solid. There's not going to be a void in the middle, right? So something squared. And we said we're going to do it with respect to X. Does everybody see my representative rectangle here that we're spinning about? Everybody good? Then I want that. And I want it in terms of X. Everybody with me? 
That's what we chose. I don't want why. But that's how we find the height of this thing, the radius, right? And oh, by the way, what is it going to go from? What is my lower and upper bounds? Can you guys see from here to here? Does anybody know what those values would be? Uh, A and B, is it until it's defined? No, it is defined actually, Austin. Oh. You're right. Generically, it is some A, some B, but we actually know what those distances are, don't we? Don't you know what this is? What is that? Radius. Well, then, what is that? Oh, it's, oh, man. Okay. And therefore, every single one of these would be a distance of r. This would just be negative r, wouldn't it? So I'm actually going from negative r to positive r. And that's not obvious, but does everybody see it now? And do you remember those little shortcuts we talked about if we ever go from negative a to positive a? Is this one of those even odd shortcuts? Like, I don't know. I don't even know what the function is. Talking about even or odd. Well, don't you know what a sphere is? And what if we cut it in half? What's going to be true about this side compared to this side? Aren't they going to be the same? And wouldn't it be easier instead of going from negative R to R and finding all of this, wouldn't it be easier to just cut it in half and just do this half, the positives? So I'm going to take this and I'm going to replace it with what? Zero. But if I do that, then what am I going to have to do to my volume that I'm going to find? Uh, multiply it by one half. No. I'm finding one half of my whole. 2V. So I'd have to double it to get the other half. Got it. Okay. Does that make sense? Cool. Yeah. If this is half that we're finding from zero to R, then I actually need the other half. And if I double the half, I get the whole. So this is just an easier way of doing it. Very good. I'm going to rewrite this as from zero, and I'm going to do it and double it. And again, pulling those constants, like pi, like two, out on the outside. But help me out, my friends. This is the hard part. I need my heights, my radii for each and every one. Here, 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 here. From our axis of rotation, what is my radius? Well, it's this. Y value, we're calling it, right? But I need it to be in terms of X. So who can help me to solve this in terms of X? Well, to get to this point right here, you guys know that it would be just go some X and up some Y, right? generically and then we know that this is the radius of our circle well then i'm going to actually label that as x and because this is a right triangle that we formed don't we know that x squared plus y squared is equal to our r squared and what are we trying to solve for uh why Trying to find the y so we can sub it in with the x value, correct? I just wanted you to say y so I could make a joke that, yes, we're trying to find the y. That's right. You nailed it, Austin. You caught yourself too. So then now I have, remember the secret sauce to all of math? Get an equation with what you want to solve for it in it. We got an equation with y and it solved for it. What would I do first? 
yeah, subtract x squared from each side and then square to get just y. Square. Uh, take the square root of each, uh, root. the entire, yeah. And I get positive and negative. My friends, you cannot take the square root of both of these individually because of that subtraction. You guys all know that 16 plus 9 is 25, which gives me an answer of 5. If you take the square root of that, you get 4. The square root of that is 3. That's 7. We know the answer should be 5. So please do not take square roots of individual pieces when it's adding or subtracting. Multiplying, all good. Dividing, all good, but not adding or subtracting. Okay? So I'm obviously doing the positive y because when we spin this around, the negative y would give me the same thing. doesn't matter. So we are going to now plug in what we know y is equal to. We'll just take the positive case in for this. The nice thing is we are going to take our pi r squared dx to find our volume. And what have we just figured out? That when we rewrite that y value in terms of what we need it, this happens to have an r in it as well as x, we get to square it. And what happens when you square a square root? It's rid of the square root, root. So now my volume is going to look like, let me use a better color here, 2 pi from 0 to r of, when we square the square root, we will just have r squared minus x squared dx. And some of you guys are like, okay, cool. We got rid of the y in terms of x, but we still have an r in there. But that's okay. Because remember, what we're actually trying to find is the volume of a sphere with some radius length, r. We don't need to know what r is. We actually don't want to know what r is. We're trying to generalize the volume of a sphere for any radius. And can we now take the antiderivative of this? Well, sure, because what does r represent? R just represents a number, some radius length, some distance. And so what do we do with a constant, which is what this actually is, when we're integrating with respect to X? We get that thing, that number, X. Okay, so again, let's just say that this was a 3. Then if this is a 3... We know when we integrate a 3, we get 3x. Does that make sense? That's the tricky part, other than having to use the Pythagorean theorem to come up with our y. Those are definitely the two trickier parts. You didn't have to do this shortcut, but it's much shorter, as you will see when I actually do the definite integral. Now, how do we integrate that? We just add one to the power, divide by the power. So we're going to get negative x cubed over 3. And we are evaluating this from 0 to r. And of course, what does that mean we then get to do? To find our volume? Well, we still have about 2 pi on the outside. Don't forget it. And now we will evaluate by plugging the r into the x there and there. And then what's going to happen when we plug in a zero? When we plug in the zero there and there, it's going to just wipe it all out, which is why we did it, rather than having to do the negative r. So we actually only have to evaluate this because the rest of it's just going to become a zero. And what happens when we plug in an r and multiply it by an r squared? We get r cubed. Minus r cubed over 3, and then, like I said, it would be minus 0. So finishing, we are going to get a volume of, well, this one I'm going to throw a 3 
over three, I'm going to multiply by that one because now I can do my subtraction. And what do we end up with inside of there? That would be two R cubed over three minus zero, which I don't need anymore. And do you guys see what we ended up with? When we multiply straight across, two times two is four pi r cubed all over three. If you were ever wondering where that formula came from, why it's four thirds times pi r cubed, you didn't know back then because you didn't have the capability, you didn't know calculus. But now using what we just went over in this section, using our flat two-dimensional circle and giving it some volume by rotating it around, with that thickness and that for my radii that we're changing, we evaluated and got the actual equation or formula for volume of a sphere. Pretty cool, a lot of people never get to see that because they don't make it this far in their careers. Right, hopefully you guys enjoyed that. Other than that, you just gotta make sure that you can then do the other things that we talked about, whether it's a solid like this, no void, AKA a disc, or you don't have the visual and you're gonna to have to do a quick little sketch of what this might look like. And if you see a square root and you don't like it, call this Y, square both sides and go to work. Graph to help you see and draw that representative rectangle. Gave you a few problems for practice. Now we're gonna move on to the third and final section of not only this chapter, but like I mentioned, this unit in this class. Luckily, I can go a little bit faster in this one because the good news is, if you haven't read through this already, check it out. We get to do exactly what we were doing in the previous section. We're still trying to find these volumes of revolution, we call them. But this time, we're going to be dealing with these things that are called cylindrical shells. So what are you still going to try to figure out? Well, is it one of those what we called a disc or a washer? Is it a solid disc or does it have a hole? and therefore a washer. And what's gonna help you to see that? Drawing that perpendicular to your axis of rotation. What we call representative rectangle. As you can see, I bolded it again a couple of other times. But as we mentioned, sometimes it's better to go in the Y direction. But we don't like changing everything with respect to Y when they've already given it to us as Y equals or F of X equals. Then it's in terms of X. And I don't want to have to go and change everything and then square them and subtract and do all that stuff. So this is a way to get around that. Okay, when you draw your representative rectangle, and it's best to have it, here's the difference, parallel to our axis of rotation instead of perpendicular, then that is going to be what is called a shell. Okay, and in that shell, what is going to happen? Well, we're still going to rotate. But now if we're asked to rotate around 
the y-axis, you can still take that thing and draw your representative rectangle just like you would have, okay? And if you take that representative rectangle, And instead of rotating around the x-axis where it's perpendicular to it, what if we rotated it around the y-axis? Well, now my width is still dx. My function is still all in terms of x. I don't have to change a bunch of stuff just to be able to do this. Because as Soraya mentioned earlier, sometimes this isn't even going to give you what you need. This is where all the change is coming. So you may not even be able to use this, even though you're rotating about that. So again, this is where it gets a little tricky. When are we going to be able to do what? Well, I know that this is the height that's changing. So I'm going to draw my representative rectangle and make all of these widths the same. But because of that, I'm going to go ahead and rotate because they asked me to this way. And therefore, it's going to form this shape, which is called, instead, a shell. All right? So I got a few more versions of it so that you can see it. My representative rectangle there. And if I only took this one, it would have this. And it kind of looks like a shell of something. And if I did all the other ones inside of it, then I would have this whole solid. But of course, what if my A and B, like Austin mentioned earlier, were here and here? Now there would be this void, right? Now I would have this hole in the middle. So that's, again, where it gets that name of a shell. Okay? Now, what if, my friends, we actually took one of these. Let's just take one of these things, and I cut it. I physically cut it right there and opened it up. What would it look like if I did that to this? Can anybody visually see that? Would it look like a rectangle? Yes, it would. You laid it flat? Oh, wow. Whoa. Like I looked ahead or something. Oh, my goodness. And that's why I tried to see if you guys could do it without me just scrolling down. Very good. And so again, this is why it's aptly named as a shell. Because we're going to take one of those representative rectangles, we are going to spin it parallel to our axis, and then we're going to just take it and unfold it. We're going to cut it. And just like Soraya had mentioned earlier, well, is there an easier way? Couldn't I just use something that I know from geometry? And as Austin mentioned, yeah. This looks like something I know. How do I find the volume of a shape like this? Well, let's just take this without the thickness. What is that, my friends? Length times width? Yeah, it's just a rectangle. So the length and the width, right? Or a lot of people will call this the length and this the width. And do we have those two things? Yeah, we still have the height. We know how to find that. That's just our function, whatever it looks like. And do we get to determine the width? Yes. Now, normally it's that dx. Now, I'm going to show you why these two things seem flip-flopped. And that's because we do have volume. We do have thickness. And if you remember in that original, this was our dx. And as we rotate that around, that's going to be our thickness. That's going to be our width of that rectangle, like it always has been. And that would be our length, like it always has been. But now, how are we going to find that other piece on the outside out here? This part. Well, because we rotated it around, what did we form? Still a circle. And do we know how to find 
that length, that distance around. Anybody remember what that's called? The circumference. Very good. Excellent, Austin. And do you remember the circumference of a circle, what the formula is? Pass. <laughs> On to uh, somebody else. Uh, yeah. Use your resources, Austin. I found a friend. Uh, Steven, Steven, get in here, man. Come on. Oh, okay. Uh, yes. Um, yes. Uh, 2 pi r squared. No, it's right there. It's not, just, uh, it's not squared, just 2 pi r. Just 2 Excuse pi me. r. You got it. But remember, our radius is going to fluctuate. It's going to change depending on which one of these little things we're looking at. And because that changes, and it changes from how far we go out to get that height and that thickness, we will use that 2 pi r, which is how far out we're going to go from the rotation, which is all dependent on x. So that's why it's 2 pi x instead of 2 pi r. Very good. Let me try to draw some of this stuff on here for you so that you understand that that is just our 2 pi r, which is what that outside stretched out piece. As Austin said, we make that cut, we open it up. Now it forms that rectangular shape. Our width is still going to be there, which is our thickness of it, and the height is still going to be there, which is dependent on each and every one of those x values, which is why they put subscript of i. It will be that height of whatever, depending on. Our function. And that's it, my friends. That is how we find volume. It's still our length times width times the thickness of this thing. And we know each and every one of those is our 2 pi x times f of x times delta x. But of course, what are we going to do? Not just that one, we're going to find all of them and how do we do that we find the sum of all of those things which is going to be our 2 pi x f of x delta x do you see my volume is still cubed does everybody see that if I put in feet there, there, and there, I would have multiplied all together cubic feet. But remember, we don't want just that one. We want all of them. So we're going to go from one to any number. And of course, we want it to be to infinity. So that's why they'll often put the little subscripts of I down there because we will keep moving out from our center of rotation and getting those different heights. What's not going to change is the thickness of every single one of those, as you can see here, if I zoom in. Okay, but the X values. And of course, the more, the better. Okay. All right. So of course, what do we get to replace all of that with to generalize this? The elongated S. Good. So we will say we're going to find it from, again, some number to some number, A to B. And what else did we say we could pull out of limits and therefore integrals? We can pull out constants. So I will only leave in the things that will vary, which means what will we still have in there? 
in x times f of x times, instead of delta, we will use our alphabet, the elongated s and the lowercase d. And I'm going to tell you right now, the two places that most people make mistakes on these, anybody want to guess? What do they leave off? Uh, two pi. Yep. Definitely the two. They'll usually oh, have yeah. the pi because the other one does. But yeah, sometimes they'll even forget the pi. And what else? How come? Because this looks like all the other ones that we've done. Other than last section. Remember last section, it was this. Why should you know you should have three things there if you don't have the square? That's two. That's one. That's cubed. You have to have one, two, three things in order to still have cube units. Okay, again, this is just another way to find the volume of a shell. All right? So I already wrote all of that up there, but I'll do it once more for you. To find that volume of the shell, we need to find the sum of all of our 2 pi x, f of x, and I'll go ahead and put delta, delta x from 1 to any number, and we want it to be the number of cuts, the most that we could possibly make. So the volume of that one shell, that's actually how we find the volume of all of them. Okay, this up here is just one of many. We said that this was what we could do to find the volume of that one shell. We want to find all of them. And we said that we can replace all of that with what? Uh, elongated x. Uh, That's right. Yeah. That's right. So again, just to not have to write this so many times. I'm going to duplicate that and put it here. And notice if it was approximately, we would just have that. And we would add up all of these different X values from one to any number. And that would be our Riemann some way. If we want to get it to change to be exactly, then we're rotating about a little bit different. The y-axis parallel to our representative rectangle. then we can replace all of this, we said, with what? The elongated S. And we also said we could pull that 2 pi out in front. So we will rewrite it as 2 pi elongated S from some number to some number, where we have x times f of x dx. Or with respect to the x-axis, that would change it up a bit. Then we would have the, the two pi first from some other value to other value. Now with everything in terms of y. Just an alternative way to do what we just did in the previous section. 
Okay, so I know that's a lot to take in. And because of that, I wanted to kind of summarize it all. So as you guys finish writing that down, anybody need more time on that? Wanted to give you the summary of all that we've done in this last two sections. Again, it could have been one really, really long one. They split it into two, the disc and washer in one. And then in this last one, six, three, the shell method. Here's how we do it. And what makes this last little chapter, 6, 1, 2, and 3, difficult is that in 6, 2, and 6, 3, we're all doing the same thing. So what are the problems all going to look? The same. The only difference is how we attack it. And what did I tell you to draw besides the graphs of your functions in order to help you visualize which of these techniques you're going to use? The disc, washer, or shell? What is it all about? The 3D model of the original function? Definitely. But uh, what's going to help you to see which one of those you're supposed to use? Trying to emphasize it more than I have ever. Okay. If you draw that little representative rectangle, which if you notice, they have done here, here, and here. Then you will be able to hopefully see that this has a thickness of dx. Dx. Or in this case, dy. And that will help you to know what all of your functions should be in terms of. And again, my advice, get rid of anything that's going to possibly make you make a mistake. That means pull the pi out on these two from 6.2 and pull the two pi out of the 6.3 shell method. All right, that's it. You guys can read through the last few things that I tried to encourage you to finish strong. Otherwise, all we have are some more problems that look just like the other ones we did in 6.2. Okay, that's all I got for you for today. Keep working hard, finish strong, you guys. And we'll get to practicing here for a little bit.